They sold out. Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton oh, City Council meeting of uh, March 17th, 2016. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I'll be presiding. Um, we will start, we'll, before we convene, we actually open with a public comment section. And as per usual, the rules are you are uh, allowed to speak on any topic for three minutes. Um, all that we ask of you is that when you step up is state your name and address and also respect the decorum of the chamber. Um, if you feel that you're going to go over three minutes, please round up your sentence and your thought, then complete at three minutes. And um, that's essentially it. So what I'm going to do is ask if uh, Hildegard Freeman can please step up. <coughs> I live in public housing, Fort Theander, Building O, Apartment 130, 413-582-7081. My Fair City, Northampton. I've been on the phone with Charlie Baker for a whole week in regard to suspicious activity and in regard to what I felt was an assault by phone calls coming in from CSO at the moment that certain people in town felt indicted, uh, new suspicious activity, and the phone calls would alert me to the fact uh, that we're going to put you in the hospital. This is a cover-up, a very neat cover-up. We're going to put you in the hospital, which they are not because you are maybe in danger if they prove you are in danger to yourself and others. If you call the police, we're going to pick you up, have you evaluated against your will. If you call the mayor again, who sits here in this chamber, the same thing is going to happen. Now, what is going on? The switch is when police, because of my report of suspicious activity, or other people feel indicted. I am not a threat to myself or others. Two Pittsfield police have talked to me that know me, one of whom has worked with a, a uh, fraud case, which involves the FBI. An attorney who is not my attorney, but has known me, I'm 75, 15 years less than 75 years. And I thank you, and I shall not be threatened. Thank you for hearing me, Mayor Knockwitz. I understood that your newspaper once said, thank you for hearing me, Charlie Baker. Thank you. Uh, Arnold Levinson, doctor. Good evening, members of the City Council. The reason I'm here is that I understand that there was a letter that was circulated regarding my remarks, regarding the water and sewer uh, question. I'm very disappointed that I had to find out about this letter secondhand and that nobody addressed me regarding this letter. This really is disappointing. In regards to the letter that was sent to, I believe, members of the City Council, there was some question as to the water and sewer rates. My understanding is that the water and sewer rates will go up 5%, 2% and 3%, water and sewer, or maybe it's vice versa. And in that letter, it, <clears throat> the letter talked about what my responsibility would be, and by convoluted math, it claimed that my percentage was going to be 2.5%. I won't get into the various mathematics in, involved. Suffice it to say that as a homeowner, or if I owned a single family, or if I owned a business property, my water and sewer rates would go up 5%. That's 5% annually. And when I say 5% annually, let's say 5% this year, 5% next year, and so on. In my personal case, in my business, yes, it'll be less than that, only because I pay a proportion of the water and sewer rate. But still, my concern is what is going to be the effect 
of continuous rises of water and sewer rates and other fees that are afflicting homeowners and businesses. I think we need to tread with caution. I think we have to look very, very carefully at, um, at rate increases and tax increases. We're in a business climate that is not exactly positive. And when we compare our water rates here in Northampton with East Hampton, West Hampton, et cetera, our neighbors, we are among the highest water rates around. We are in competition for business. And if it becomes more expensive for businesses to locate here in Northampton, then we're going to be in trouble. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Wes Hardy, Mark Circle. Um, I don't know if you guys have this handout, the one that shows uh, rate structures, uh, volumetric okay. and uh, rate structures. It says that the units are 100 CCF which would put water revenues somewhere north of half a billion a year. So there's no way that those numbers can possibly be right. There's no way it's 100 CCF. It's just it's an impossibility. Um, the other thing is if you have this handout, um, and to Dr. Levinson's point, um, this is off the city's website. Since 97, uh, to, so 97 to 2015, there's been a 233% total increase. So although we're being told that it's not going to increase 5% a year, it's averaged an increase of over 12% a year. So it seems difficult to understand that somehow we're, it's gonna get cheaper if we change our rate structure and still need the revenues. And lastly on revenues, the second page in the handout shows our enterprise funds. Enterprise funds is a straight off a of DOR from 2000 to 2014. And you can see they kind of dipped to 2013 to 2014. Yet, when we go to that last page, right, there's a category other, which is 1.6 million about. But even if you subtract the 1.6 million from the total revenues, the overall revenue increased for water and sewer. So I just, I. I don't see the emergency. I don't see an impending catastrophe. If there was one, I'd be all for it. I just think, to Mr. Levinson's, Dr. Levinson's point, you know, businesses are going to compete, and they're going to compete based on what rates cost. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak at this time? Jasper? So I'm Jasper Lapiensky. I live at 43 West Street. Um, I don't know who put this agenda together, but I just read it in 15 seconds, so I'm impressed. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't have anything prepared, so what I'm going to say is very simple. Um, there is probably some sort of process underway to get a new official director of public works. I think that the city council and the public should be involved in picking who it is, mostly because um, that person is going to be vastly consequential as far as what the city looks like physically and socially for the next many, many years, potentially even outliving Mayor Narkowitz, uh, not in life, but on in government. Um, and so, this is this. I, I know there was some hearings and some public meetings having to do with picking a new police chief. I wasn't involved in that, um, but basically, the Department of Public Works in a town or a city of this size is what governs what our lives look like as citizens of Northampton, and everyone should feel that they have a stake in it, and everyone should have an easily accessible way to voice their opinion. Um, I'd be willing to send an email to the mayor. I'd also be willing to bet that one of his staff will read it and say, hey, mayor, somebody thinks this. And that's not, um, I, I don't know what the process is. I have not done a lot of research on that. Um, 
I'm just explaining what I think would be a good idea uh, for the purpose of, uh, I don't know, maybe somebody at city council would like to propose that there's a here. I could do more research, um, but that's what I wanted to talk about. And now you know what I have to say. And at some point, maybe I'll decide to say it again a little more eloquently. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak at this time? Uh, okay. I'll call the administrative assistant to call the roll. Adam. Here. Councilor Bidwell. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. <coughs> Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Sheriff. Here. We have a quorum. In fact, everyone's here. Um, uh, before we start, I, I think it's worth acknowledging Council Shara's very happy birthday today that she's sharing with us. Uh, okay. uh -oh. so the fact you know. that she's celebrating her birthday with us is very impressive. Uh, it's very There's impressive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Uh, we have no hearing scheduled tonight, and um, so we'll go to uh, recognition of one-minute announcements. Are there any one-minute announcements? Council LaBarge. Yes. Um, I received a couple of calls from um, some residents of mine in Ward 6 wanting to know about the celebrating the corned beef and cabbage dinner at the Senior Center, so I called there today, and I just want to announce that they are sold out. You cannot buy any tickets at all, so I think that's important that the residents in this city know that. Okay. So if you're counting on that, sorry. Um, the, so uh, it, relative to that, actually, I would like to remind counselors that the, the Holyoke St. Patrick's Day Parade steps off at 10 a.m. Actually, I think, yeah, it steps off at 10 a.m. in... At what? The bus. The bus, the bus, the bus, bus, leaves, the bus leaves at 10 from JJ's for folks who want to go to uh, uh, to attend the parade, to march in the parade. Um, but we are, there are member, our membership is expected in some level, with some capacity. I'll be there. Um, I understand it might be a nor'easter, so, uh, which should make it interesting, but I also understand we're leaving we step off earlier than we have in the past. Sometimes we've spent the better part of a weekend in that parking lot, but th this year. So if, um, just to let you know, that's happening, and hope I hope I see you there and dress appropriately. Any other announcements? OK. Uh, communications from the mayor, proclamations? March. Yes. March. Proclamation, March. proclamation, but and the um, but the person who requested it does not appear to be here. Uh, so um, what I may do is uh, just post it on my website, and uh, and I can uh, see whether that person wants to arrange to pick it up. Okay. Can you just state what it was? About? Sure. It's actually. Um, uh, March is a, is Social Work Month. You may recall that uh, I've done this proclamation in the past. So it's basically a, um, a proclamation honoring and recognizing the numerous contributions of America's 600,000 social workers. So um, it'll be posted on our website. But I, I um, the person who is supposed to come and receive it does not appear to be here. So I will um, I'll get this to them. And okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no resolutions, no presentations. So we're up to the consent agenda. Um, that includes the meeting minutes from uh, the city council meeting March 3rd, 2016, and also the petition for a secondhand dealer's license for Antiquarian LLC at 108 Main Street. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I miss something. The, it should be acknowledged that the owner of, of uh, Antiquarian LLC is here, but because uh, this was embedded in the consent agenda, there is no debate and discussion. So, uh, very thank you very much for showing up, and uh, it's, and the petition is moved forward. So. 
Okay. And you get to watch a city council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> or not. You're, you're also, you're, you're not obliged to stay either, so. Um, I'm all set. You're all set? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now item nine. This is uh, 16.030. This is the financial order to establish water and sewer rates for FY 2017. This will be the first reading. Um, two public hearings were held to discuss the proposed rates. The first public hearing took place on February 29, 2016. as a part of the City Council Committee on Public Works and Utilities meeting. Uh, the committee voted unanimously to return the order back to the full City Council with no or a neutral recommendation. And minutes of that meeting are attached um, on the agenda. Uh, the second public meeting uh, took place on March 9th, 2016, as part of a special meeting of the City Council Committee on Finance. And the committee voted to return the order back to the full City Council, again with a neutral recommendation, three yes, uh, zero no one absent. Uh, and um, I think Councilor Carney wasn't. Um, sure oh, just back. just a correction that I was present at that uh, second public hearing and did hear the presentation from the mayor and comments from residents and my other colleagues who were here, but unfortunately was called. I needed to leave prior she to. She wasn't the, there for the vote. For, for the, the vote. vote. Okay, so, so you that's. But I would have uh, <laughs> concurred with my colleagues to send this forward with a neutral recommendation. So, sorry, I couldn't squeeze that into the parentheses. <laughs> okay. So, um, so uh, I will accept a motion and put this on the floor for discussion. Make so, a motion. Uh, okay. Motion seconded. Uh, Bidwell, Labarge. Councilors, floor is yours. And the, the mayor is here. Jim Laurel is here. Um, if you have any questions, yes. Councilor Labarge. Mayor. I know that I had some concerns with a letter to the editor and I had talked with our financial director in regards to we are on the road to becoming paradise lost. And I was very concerned of hearing about 700 donuts that had to be made and, and, and sold in order to pay for whatever the cost was going to be for the business owner. In this article in the paper, which I was very confused with this, which is saying at a recent meeting to discuss future water and sewer rates, it was recommended that they be increased by 5% annually. <coughs> I have a problem with that 5%. If one compares our rates with our neighbors, and that's significantly great concerns to me because it was brought up by two residents about other neighboring towns or cities. And I want to thank you for giving us a breakdown on the eight cities and towns that we have from Agawam, Amherst, Chicopee, East Hampton, Greenfield. What I have noticed, and I talked with Susan today, was in Westfield, senior residential, and I had mentioned that before, we have seniors in our city who are over that threshold and they cannot get any kind of an exempt. If you look in Westfield, maybe you could answer this question for me. Senior residential, a total of 3780 a year for those permanent Westfield residents 65 years of age or older who own and occupy the unit for which the senior residential rate is claimed. Can you explain that part for me? Um, I can just tell you, uh, do you mind, I'm just going to grab this. Yeah. I don't have, I was trying to pull it up all Again, we just we just looked at what everyone had on their rate, so I, I can't give you the background on that. I can't tell you what the um, what the policy rationale is. Um, I do believe uh, my understanding uh, is that that applies to the sewer rate only. 
Um, Just to the south. And, um, and again, that's a decision that the city of Westfield made. I think I've stated publicly that I, I don't support as a public policy matter that there's a discount just based on age. I'm, I, would, I support a discount based on means, which is why one of the things we've built into this is that there is a low income discount. Um, that if you are a senior or frankly if you're a family or you're an individual who meets that threshold, you're eligible for um, applying for an abatement. Um, so that is a feature of Westfield. I can't really speak to why and what the rationale for it is. Um, it's just not, it's not a part of the proposal that I put forward. Okay. Also, too, in that article that was in the paper, I want to thank you for explaining <coughs> because there was some confusion with that article of needing to sell more than 700 donuts just to pay the water bill. And you had explained because the building is owned by owners from Westfield. There are five stores in that building. And there's a laundromat that apparently consumes 60% of the, of the consumption of water. Can you explain that? Um, I, I, just to be clear, you contacted our office because you were concerned about right. the letter and you were concerned about that particular um, business. So we, we basically did what we did in the PowerPoint presentation where we took a bunch of select businesses and we just took a look at their bill and took a look at their average bill um, for uh, a whole year. Right. Um, and then we also took a look at the fact that it's a, that there's one two inch uh, uh, sewer uh, or water hookup that's serving that entire building. So then the, the five businesses that are in there, the, um, the water and sewer bill gets apportioned by the landlord. It's not nothing that the city has anything to do with. Right. We did have information that the laundromat, um, as part of their lease, um, uh, pays for 60% of the water and sewer bill. And then the remaining uh, four businesses right. are s responsible for the remaining 40%. I don't know how it's apportioned. In my um, email to you, I just did a hypothetical calculation that assuming that you know each of them were responsible for 25% of the remaining 40%, and then I just did a calculation. Again, using actual consumption numbers for um, the last full year, and we did an average quarterly consumption. Um, and so we just ex we, we went ahead and ran those numbers just like we ran the scenarios for Spoletto's and for, you know, right. this is all exactly. publicly available information. No, but this um, was very important. Well, I, again, I, I, and again, I'm not, I, I don't, um, I, I don't, as I think I said in the email, I, I have um, great respect for that particular business owner, and I, um, I obviously don't know about the um, the the inner workings of the business and all that. All I could speak to was the actual rate and what the impacts were. In terms I think of that's what you want as counselors to know the yeah. actual rates. And then the only other thing I tried to correct um, was again when I spoke to you and we made our presentations, um, we are attempting to raise uh, two percent. Um, Rev increase in revenue on water side, uh, three percent on the sewer side, um, but that does not equal a combined five percent increase in water and sewer. Um, it's actually a two and a half percent increase. So I was just, I also wanted to make sure that um, that was corrected, because obviously, you know, there's a significant difference between a two and a half and a five percent. But I also said that that is in the overall revenue. Every individual um, customer. Um, the rate and the rate structure will affect them differently based on the size and based on their consumption. So that's why we've encouraged people. You can't just, um, it, you know, it, it's actually very similar to the tax rate. Um, you know, if the tax rate goes up X percent, that doesn't mean that each person's individual taxes will go up by that percent because every year um, your assessment may change. Um, and so, and assessments all around the city may change as value shifts. So, um, that's the that's the increase in the tax rate, but how it's applied to each individual situation that can be different. I appreciate this information. And again, I just want to be clear: you requested that I we provide you information that. on it, so and we were right. just we were answering a request from a counselor on it. So, and I thank you for it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I should note that representatives from Woodcock and Associates uh, have, have, are present too, so if, if, if there are questions for them as well. And Ref, tell us as well. <coughs> um, other questions, other comments, discussion? Council Bidwell. Yes, I, I, I would like to, uh, I'll, I'll be voting for this at first reading, and I'd like to say a few words of, of, of support for what I found to be a, a really thoughtfully developed uh, proposal with input from, uh, by all accounts, uh, a really excellent team of consultants. I like uh, the incentives for conservation. Uh, I like the transition to greater reliance on fixed costs as opposed to volumetric. Uh, I wish we could be doing more. Maybe in future years we can move further in that, in that direction. I think that's the direction it should be going. Whether you're using 10 gallons or 10,000 gallons, there's fixed costs that everybody has to pay for. Uh, I like the low income uh, partial exemption. I think it's a matter of important equity that there's a, the fire protection charges in there. Uh, I'm impressed that all this can be done with a projected fairly steady revenue stream, which is necessary for the, for the bonding that, uh, of course, is the financial engine behind all this. Uh, it's proactive with regard to capital needs looking, looking, looking forward. Um, and yes, though, though it's, it's such an apples and oranges thing with regard to other towns and cities, uh, all in all, our, 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 our rates probably are higher than some. Um, but it was important for me to realize that that's in part because we do have an enormously complicated system with dams and reservoirs and, uh, at, at, at some distance from the users. And there's a, there's a lot of cost there spread across a, a relatively small uh, user base. Um, and I also th believe that, that, well, there have been many questions asked and answered, and I, and, and I appreciate the attention given to the, the questions that have been raised at, uh, at, at public hearings and here and, and the way they've been answered, including the clarification that the average of 2% and 3% is 2.5%, not 5%. Um, but I, 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 really, um, I, I really doubt that the impact of these water and sewer increases in relation to ev all other components of the costs of doing a business are going to be a, a make it or break function. I think if we're going to compare cost of doing business in Northampton with cost of doing businesses in, in other cities and towns, we need to look more comprehensively at it. And part of that comprehensive look is our property tax where we are operate at a considerable competitive advantage with, with, with other cities and towns. Fortunately, we have a process underway in the Community Resources Committee to, to look at local, uh, local business economic factors. So hopefully we can get some real good data on the table to sort of set the record straight on all that. But for a whole variety of reasons, uh, I think it's a, 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 a well-supported, well-argued proposal, and I'll be voting for it. Councilor Klein. Um, probably everybody heard today about how the uh, metro, the subway system in D.C. was shut down for the day. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just kind of another, the latest example, I think, of a city that um, sunk a lot of money into a very expensive system a long time ago, about 50, 60 years ago, I think, and didn't um, plan for its upkeep. And I'm really proud to be in a city where we're thinking about really supporting the infrastructure of our water and sewer delivery system. And I guess you don't call it delivery system for the sewer. But um, I, I think that these rates are absolutely reasonable. I really appreciate that Councillor Adams asked for the um, rate comparisons because what it helped me to really understand and I think is really important for the citizens of Northampton to understand is that you can't compare them. You're, you are comparing apples to oranges. And I know this has been said, but I want to say it again. <coughs> um, for instance, the sewer rates in Northampton that are proposed are based on 80% of water consumption, whereas most of the cities that we're looking at in this chart are based on 100% um, of water consumption. And so you have to do some mathematics to really figure out what how the rates compare to these other cities. And as Councillor Bidwell said, some of them are perhaps, so our rates are somewhat higher than some cities, but I don't think um, extravagantly so. 
and I think any of that extra cost is really important for the ongoing structure of our water and sewer system, and I really support that. I think it's, um, I think it's the way to run a city well, and I, uh, I will vote yes on this tonight. Councilor O'Donnell. Uh, I think Councilor uh, Bidwell and, and Klein laid out um, solid reasons to, uh, to support this, and um, I largely agree with what they said. I have just a question that's kind of a little more, more granular, and it's not really um, a criticism. It's a question because, in a sense, this is the first time we've ever actually done this. We did it last year as a council, but of course rates didn't change last year, so that was kind of pro forma. And so I think actually we might have a um, might have a, a special responsibility to do this in a certain way this time, and I'm actually gratified that um, there is so much data uh, and research that's been brought forward and that the council is considering this carefully, because that's the way it should happen going forward if the council is going to have a role in rate setting. And I just wanted to review why we are rate setting, and I think it's been said sometimes that it's because of the charter, and that's kind of only half correct, of course, because the charter says the mayor sets up uh, city government essentially through an administrative order, and it's through your administrative order that the council is taking a vote on this. It's not a requirement of the charter. You have, you know, the B the BPW has gone away, and now the uh, city government is organized in such a way that we vote on these rates. My question is because there have been some uh, very positive changes in, in the proposal, namely what you're doing with fixed rates and also low income exemptions, um, which are very important and, and change what people would pay um, significantly, especially the low income exemptions. What's interesting is those elements of that are not something we're voting on. Um, that's just a, a fact. We're voting on the rates, but we're not voting on the fixed costs or the exemptions. And for me, that's not, again, a criticism or reason to oppose it, but I guess my question is in the future, is that something to revisit? Further on the agenda, we're going we're to look at an ordinance that deletes all the fees from the Code of Ordinances because we accepted a state law to essentially transfer them to the executive. Um, would fixed rates and low-income exemptions in the future be something you would consider bringing into the council process as well for approval in this, in this new kind of collaborative process we have for approving rates? Yeah, um, you know, I guess it's something I can I can look at going forward. I mean, the low income exemption, um, we're basically using the existing state framework that's right. that set out in state law that we use for taxes and for CPA. So right. we're sort of bound by that, and we're just extending that um, uh, to those uh, customers that qualify. Um, so I don't, I'm not really sure how that's a, a a vote on a f on the r a rate or a fee, even it's it's just we're 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 trying to build that into the program. Right, could be more a vote on the inclusion of it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just because in a way, this is we're 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 voting on only part of the entire yeah. proposal. So yeah, yeah. So you're, it's, you know, the volumetric rates and then the actual fixed fees that are being charged. Right. Um, you know, again, we view those as uh, fees, fixed fees that the agency is charging mm -hmm. as part of its ongoing that are that are separate from the actual consumption of water and, and sewer. So I mean, I guess that's the distinction. Um, in the past, um, those rates were, you know, the volumetric rates were what were being voted on right. on a continual basis. Right, right. And DPW was, you know, reviewing, you know, I, I suppose was monitoring the fixed rates. But um, I guess it's something I can, I can think about and, and for next time. Um, again, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't, not, I don't, I would be, f had I brought it forward that way, I'd still, you know, stand behind that right. um, the, yeah. that proposal. Um, yeah. We were just trying to draw the distinction between the fees versus the actual uh, uh, per CCF rates. Yep, absolutely. I, yeah. I just offer it in the spirit of, you know, this is the first time we're, we're kind of feeling our way forward and mm -hmm. figuring out the process. So. No, I appreciate that, yeah. and I and I appreciate your comments about the, um, you know, about the uh, ab about the administrative order. Because that was something that uh, was a change that I that I put forward. It wasn't something that was automatic under the charter. So True. Um, okay. I do believe it's important for elected officials to have be part of the accountability for that process. So. Thank you. 
Councilor Adams and then Councilor Barge. I have a different perspective. I think that the new uh, proposed structure will disproportionately and negatively affect the business community, particularly the businesses that our economy relies on and has been relying on more and more, for example, restaurants, cafes, and bars. Um, the cost of doing business has gone up in Northampton and other places I recognize, but some would characterize that the cost of doing business in Northampton has gone up dramatically um, in the last several years. <clears throat> One of the reasons, I believe, is the high cost of rent downtown, and some people may blame this on greedy landlords. I think that that's um, self-serving, particularly coming from public officials, because it's something that we can't easily control. Um, I, I think, I believe, the primary reason for high rents is the cost of doing business in Northampton. I don't believe that we're pro-business simply because we have a single tax rate for residential and commercial. I don't think we're competitive simply because we have a high tax, uh, uh, single tax rate for residential and commercial. Many communities that we compete for with respect to drawing bu businesses in the community have um, a, a single rate. Many of those communities do not have a stormwater and flood control fee. All of those communities almost have lower, st um, lower water and sewer rates. I think that every time we're asked to raise a fee or impose a new one, we're asked to consider it in a vacuum, but I think we really need to consider the cumulative costs of, um, of doing business in the city. The city government makes extraordinary er efforts to raise revenue. I think that's good. I support raising revenue. It's extremely important to raise revenue and to look for new ways to raise revenue. But I'm not going to support every single new way of raising revenue if I don't think it's fair, and I don't think this one is particularly fair, and I think it's going to have un unintended negative consequences. Um, there's a lot of empty storefronts on Main Street. I don't need a study to, to tell me that. I think that's an obvious truth. Um, <clears throat> as Bob Dylan once said, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Um, the new rate structure will put an increased burden on the very types of businesses that will likely fill the vacancies, if they're to be filled at all. And I think we have to be sensitive to this. And I do, I am concerned that our, our fees are becoming extravagant. Um, I'll give an example of how I think that this is extravagant. I think that businesses do look to, looking to locate, locate here, um, do look at rates and compare them to other communities. I, I think they actually do. I'll give an example. Coca-Cola. <clears throat> Under this rate structure, Coca-Cola will pay $6.09 per CCF of water and a sewer rate of $7.52. Um, the Westfield combined water and sewer rate is $5.59. So let, let, let me clarify. Westfield's combined rate is um, less than water by itself and less than sewer by itself. And Agawam is even cheaper than Westfield, just by way of example. So I, I understand completely that we're not similarly situated exactly with them with respect to our, our needs um, for infrastructure and for you know, water and sewer, et cetera. But I do believe that business is looking to locate somewhere, uh, do look at those things. Um, some, some might say, hey, that, well, that's Coca-Cola, and you know, they're an evil corporation. But we gave them a tax break. This, this council voted to give them a tax break because we wanted them in the city. And we did so because um, for the revenue that they bring and for the jobs that they bring. <clears throat> that's an example. But I think about the other businesses as well that will be negatively affected by, the, uh, by this, in my opinion. Um, I think at a minimum, we need further study and analysis on the impacts of the proposal, particularly on the business community. Um, at a minimum, and <clears throat> I think that should take precedence over the and priority over the imp excuse me over the impulse to implement this this fiscal year. Um, any increases in water and sewer need for FY17 can be raised under the existing rate structure, um, and please note that I believe this con this discussion has been framed in the context of no alternative that we have to do this and we have to do it now. I don't accept that and I don't believe that. Um, <clears throat> And just a couple other notes. The fire protection charges are an awful lot like the fire protection fee that was held to be an illegal tax in a Massachusetts SJC case called Emerson versus the city of Boston. I believe that's subject to legal challenge. It's an awful lot like that, um, that case. Finally, um, I, I just think that we're doing an economic study. Um, this council is. I think we should be waiting until we that's completed before we undertake this proposal. And again, we can raise any additional revenues under the structure that we have currently right now. So, you know, I, I do believe it's, again, it's been placed in the context of no alternative, and I, and I, and I disagree with that. Thank you. Council could LaBarge. I, could, I, uh, could I have an opportunity to just at least, well, it's up to you. Did you want to, uh, 
Council LaBarge, do you? No, that's okay, Len. Okay. I do uh -huh. just want to address a couple of things um, in that. Um, again, I think there's a, there's a confusion that we've been trying to um, talk about, which is that, and it's, it's interesting because if you look at some of the comparable rates of other communities, some communities have implemented a residential and a commercial rate. And you'll note in most cases, the commercial rate is twice the residential rate. Um, we've explicitly not done that. We've, we've looked to, we're focusing not on commercial residential, we're focusing on small users and large users. And in fact, many of our small businesses, the ones that, including many of the ones that we're referring to when we talk about downtown, are in the small user class. They're not, so actually to have a commercial uh, residential split would actually be unfair for a city like Northampton. It's part of the reason why we keep the single tax rate, um, because we have so many small local businesses. We still have, uh, you know, I think four bookstores at last count, uh, which many other communities can't boast. Um, and um, and so we are, uh, so there's a reason why we set the structure up this way. So um, the other piece I want to say is, you know, talking about Westfield. Um, yeah, Westfield has perhaps a more competitive water and sewer rate. Again, they have a commercial tax rate of $36.68 per thousand. Our commercial tax rate is $16.16 per thousand. And, um, I can tell you I've met with lots of businesses and, I mean, uh, property taxes are the, probably the largest, uh, largest part of a business's operating expenses in terms of city-imposed or town-imposed operating expenses. And so um, that, that uh, differential, I think, has to be considered when you're looking at our water and sewer rates, when we're comparing ourselves to Westfield. I think if you are just going to compare the water and sewer rates, that's just not a fair comparison. Um, so, you know, I, you know, we do this chart every year with our tax rate, and there's Northampton um, against all these other competitive communities that you have the tax, the comparisons on, and only East Hampton has a lower, uh, uh, that's a commercial and residential tax rate. Um, actually, it's a commercial rate. So, you know, um, Holyoke boasts some of the least expensive water in the state, and they generate it themselves, you know, with their uh, reservoir and their dam, I mean, their, their dam, and, um, but again, they have the highest commercial tax rate in, um, in Massachusetts. So, uh, so again, I think you have to look at all of those factors. Um, and if you look at, you know, we did this comparison to show people what the increases would be. And, um, and I think business owners who take a look and actually run the calculation uh, will see that we, this is not in any way punitive toward businesses. Um, we're trying to build equity in terms of uh, user uh, types and, uh, and consumption. Uh, Council LaBarge. Um, no, I just want to thank the mayor and also thank the consultants. Um, you spent a year going through to figure out how we were going to set our water and sewer rates. I have to say with our mayor, we had a hearing a year ago and he did hear what the residents were asking, that they could not afford it at that time because we had the stormwater utility fee that was placed. And our mayor heard what our residents were saying at that hearing. And as a counselor, and I think Councillor Adams, you had voice too, of really looking at the big picture of affordability. I have not heard anything bad from any of my residents about the increase of these rates residential, except for one person. Finally, yesterday we talked and he said, you know what? He said, it's not bad. So. I am going to support this. I appreciate what you've done as consultants, and it is affordable. There's no question about residential, and also with commercial. I haven't, I, I'm surprised. I have not seen any businesses in here at all. So why they're not here and have not come to the hearings, why? were they not here? That's in question. Are they happy? Don't know. Are they not happy? And are they gonna move and go to another town or city? Who knows? 
but I do know that with the breakdown on the water and sewer rates compared with other communities, I think it is actually telling us, which the mayor explained, is the breakdown. I mean, every city, every town runs differently. You look at your roads, how many miles of roads, and an enterprise bond, bonding. It's, I want to thank all of you for all the hard work that you've done, and I want to thank my mayor especially for doing what he did for a whole year and letting people be able to get back on their feet after that stormwater utility fee and the two bills that were hit for the first time. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Um, could I just answer one other question, which I sure I, I would. Other, um, and that was do, I, I want to acknowledge that um, Dr. Levinson here is has represented in the hearings and tonight as a business owner. So the, just just for the record. Yeah, he was yeah. here last time too. Right. I just wanted to say there was a question raised about the um, <coughs> about the f uh, legality of the um, fire uh, line fee, and that has in fact been tested in court. Um, there's a case uh, involving the town of Franklin, Mass, um, in which that, among a number of issues, and um, and it has been upheld. Um, and in fact, Mr. Woodcock was a consultant on that case, so we, he has a lot of information about it. Um, but in fact, it's a it's a fee that Boston has, Worcester has, Springfield has. You'll see in some of your in some of the comparison communities, other communities have, um, and uh, and so it has. It's it's not illegal. It's uh, it's not the same as the Emerson case. It meets the test uh, that the SJC has set forth um, in terms of uh, the differential between a fee and a tax. Uh, Councilor Carney. Um, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, um, I do want to uh, agree with many of the specific points that Councilor Bidwell pointed out in terms of um, uh, this study and the and the proposal. I'm satisfied from the public hearings that that I was in, where I was in attendance, and from hearing from uh, residents and businesses that, uh, generally speaking, the re the residential uh, impact is neutral, if not, I mean, when I did my own calculator, it's actually gone down um, for at least for this first year. And what seemed to be, as we looked at this, uh, the businesses that were presented to us and those discussed in the, in the letter that was exchanged, modest increases uh, given the fact that we have such an enormous amount of infrastructure that needs investment. So I'm prepared to support this, and I want to thank the mayor for taking the time. This was a very deliberate process. We took the, we took the year of, of maintaining a frozen rate, um, which was, I think, very helpful to residents to, to be able to uh, digest the fact that we were going to need to do something. And then to look at really what um, was a very thoughtful process and <coughs> uh, been able to distinguish between users. And uh, ultimately, that's where the cost is, is the you know, volumetric, the amount of uh, use of water and sewer. So I'm prepared to support this and want to thank uh, the mayor and the DPW for all the work that's been done, and the finance director for just crunch, the number crunching and just an enormous amount of uh, sophisticated work that I appreciate. Thank you. Councilor Adams. Mayor, um, I, I learned from an email that Terry Masterson's presenting his downtown review to the Chamber of Commerce tomorrow. He's not. Um, oh, he's not? No, he's not. Oh, okay. Yeah, I believe that was some misinformation that then got, you know, sent out, but no, he, he actually is not, oh, and I apologize you. for that. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Our hope is actually to, um, to uh, release that on Monday, and um, and then he is I, well. I'll tell you now. I haven't answered your email. The plan would be for him to come to your committee. I know, which is just going to be asking him some questions about it. But our plan was to um, release that on Monday. We're just doing some final uh, tweaks on it. Oh, because I think that would have been extremely helpful to have prior to this vote, particularly given all the concerns about the impact of this on the business community. Thank you. Other questions, discussion. Um, does 
Terry's report or view consider uh, water rates? It does not. No, it, it does not. It's um, it's mainly looking at um, a number of different economic indicators, everything from, um, uh, you know, from visitorship, hotel occupancy, um, some some revenue indicators like, you know, meals tax and parking. It also looks at, um, it's also looking at some of the uh, uh, rental rates and vacancy rates and things like that. So, uh, but it's not focused on water and sewer rates um, in any way. Councilor Adams? No, I just I have nothing to add. Just that would have been extremely valuable beforehand. Well, you'll certainly have it before second reading. So I'm hopeful you'll uh, uh, have a chance to review it. But it's, it's yeah, we're basically trying to put together information from lots of different sources. And it's a first attempt at this. And so um, we're going to hope to build on it every year. Um, so that's. That's your teaser for Monday. Um, Any other discussion, Councilor Scher? Um, I think I've been at all of the presentations and meetings, starting with the first one where we had a very lengthy presentation. Yes. Um, and then and with each one, I feel like even more and more information and answers have been, questions have been answered. And so I appreciate all the initial work and then continual work that's been done. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel like tonight the question's been asked whether um, whether it would make sense to keep our current rate structure and, but maybe raise those rates. Or also it's whether um, perhaps this new fixed rate should perhaps be higher. Could you just talk a little bit more about how, um, how that fixed rate was reached and, you know, whether you think maybe that that's uh, something that in the future might be yeah, we did talk. Um, I think I mentioned to you that when in the or in throughout the presentations that the fixed fee is so small that it represents um, you know less than one percent of the overall revenue. It's like 0. 0.5 or 0. 0.6 or something percent of the revenue. Um, 0. 0.4, I think it is. And um, and that was one of the things that uh, that that uh, Mr. Woodcock and Mr. Fox um, pointed out was sort of a, a weakness of our current system in terms of revenue stability. Um, but obviously, uh, when we made the um, decision to try to increase that, we wanted to do it in a gradual fashion and not because um, you can see. Well, we'd, I don't have the chart up, but. When you look at the lower, uh, the smaller customers, in many cases, the biggest part of their increase, if you're a low water user, is just the change in the fixed fee. You're going from a dollar to twelve dollars and you know forty six cents a quarter. Um, so if you think about that statistically, it's a big jump, um, but it's obviously you know eleven dollars and, and uh, sixty four cents. Um, so the idea was to try to get that up to, uh, I think we, it, it's about two and a half percent now. Um, but it is something we're going to look at, uh, review continuously. I don't view it as something that's going to change every year. I view it as something we're going to review. Um, and then obviously the fire, uh, uh, the fire charge was another way to kind of diversify that, you know, the revenue um, as well from a fixed uh, from a fixed fee, and and frankly to, to capture some of the costs of a of a specialized service that's made available that everyone else is currently um, bearing the costs of. Um, so, um, you know, I I'm happy to actually yield the floor to uh, to one of our consultants to talk about you know what what uh, formulations you use to come up with those or to recommend those. But it's uh, just, did I capture it or? Okay. Okay. Questions, comments? Council just, just one final observation. Um, I know there's different ways of looking at this, but again, this is the first time we're actually going to be weighing in on this in a serious way as a council, and I think we have some special responsibility to um, conduct our deliberations in a thoughtful and honest way, and I just want to reiterate what I think everyone knows, which is this isn't just a vote for the next fiscal year on whether or not rates should go up and how much. It's a vote on one part of a financial plan for the next five years, for the next 10 years, 20 years. I, don't, I think we owe people in Northampton not just an opinion, I think we owe them a plan. And so could there be alternate plans? Perhaps. Um, but if we're going to take a position on rates, it needs to have a plan attached to it. And I support these rates because 
there's <laughs> a substantial amount of planning that's gone into it in analysis and research, and um, that's what we that's what we owe the people of Northampton. Otherwise, I don't I don't think it's a responsible uh, vote just to, uh, just to weigh in without having a financial plan that we need to, to maintain our infrastructure going forward. Um. Actually, I, I agree with Council O'Donnell. We're actually talking, we're, we are revamping the structure principally. That's actually the more, the more salient point about this discussion and debate. It's revising the structure with an eye towards equity and fairness as opposed to, a, and, and flexibility without the rigidity that we previously knew. And to the extent about the impacts, I mean, Councilor Adams and I are going to have a difference of opinion about what those impacts are. And in fact, actually, this is why we established this committee, was to find out if either of our opinions are correct or some, some combination of the two. But the fact is that I believe, as Councilor Bidwell asserted, that in the calculus of looking for a business, I think the water rates are not uh, primary on the, on the review scale. But also to Councilor Adams' point, they they look at it in the aggregate, the cost of doing business in the in the community, um, and there are greater pressure points than the water rates, which uh, require our diligence as well. So, and and I think in the principal one, as the mayor asserted, and I agree with, it's a property tax rate, some of which. Uh, again goes back to my old drum beat, but it's uh, a continual uh, abrogation of responsibility on the state side by diminishing their responsibility for collecting a progressive tax and reverting to regressive tax systems that find us dealing with this. And I've often said that you don't play the cards you wish you had, you have to play the cards that are dealt before you. And in this circumstance, wh I think I'm, as I said before, I'm very glad that actually now that these decisions actually fall upon us because there is accountability. We are subject to being voted out of office. We are, um, we hear from the community. And whereas before the rate structures were established more or less in camera, and I think you've been hard, it's been really hard to put away. It's okay. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, Siri's hollering now. It's at the, <laughs> the sorry about that. But, <laughs> sorry. The, but the, the, <coughs> there's an opportunity here, and the opportunity has been present. I, I actually have been struck, and I think a number of other councils have commented on the fact that the um, absence of uh, community input relative to and particularly compared to what we experienced last year. Last year, when we're, this was our very first time out of the gate when we were supposed to review these fees, and there was vehement uh, discussion and, uh, and, and confusion. And to the mayor's credit, he walked it back. He said, we are going to hold off on this. Uh, the, there are clocks ticking. There was no uh, description of urgency or, or emergency. I had never heard those words invoked, and I don't think it was ever played. But there is an obligation. This is the process that we do. This is what we do. We set the rates. And so walking it back and giving and taking a year and not taking a year based on empirical notions, but actually asking for review and study and soliciting review and study. And, and I, I agree, I'm, I've been quite impressed by the presentation by Woodcock and Associates, and, and I um, am grateful for it because, you know, uh, my tiny brain has problems calculating so many things. So this was very, this was particularly helpful. So I think in, in uh, my inclination, of course, is also to vote in favor of this as well. So if um, anyone has any other debate or discussion, uh, Councilor Adams? If, if there's no urgency, then would you oppose me asserting charter objection? Well, I, you can't oppose a charter objection. I, well, I mean, that is your privilege. I, mean, I know, I know. Uh, and and the, the charter objection would essentially allow would, would, and debate and would defer the vote to the next meeting. 
and which we already have a vote on the next meeting. We have a second reading on the next meeting too. So I, I mean, it is your privilege to invoke that, and that's fine. I, uh, I, I wouldn't endorse it, but I mean, uh, it is certainly your privilege to do that. And I'm prepared to call the vote. So that if you were going to, if you were going to present that objection, now would be the time. Uh, ready for a vote? Roll call, please. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Adams. No. It passes in first reading. Uh, the next time, the next vote will be at the next council meeting, April 6th. Thank you. Is it the seventh? Seventh. Seventh. seventh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> Don't come April 6th. It'd be a long wait. April 7th, thank you. Um, sorry, I keep getting bounced off the Wi Fi here. So, uh, next up we have item 16.030. It's a financial. Oh, nope, sorry. 16.030. Uh, 16.032, thank you. Financial order for intermunicipal agreements with Williamsburg and West Springfield. This is a uh, second reading. Move approval. Second. Any further discussion on this item? I did that get a second. Yeah. First and second. Oh. Murphy, right? Yeah, we'll Murphy O'Donnell. Yep, I got it. Okay. Thank you. Same thing. Uh, no further debate? Any questions? Roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. <coughs> Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. That passes in second reading. We have item 16.033, financial order to appropriate $30,825 from insurance proceeds to the uh, Police Department OOM account. Move approval. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Discussion? Council O'Donnell? Just be careful of puddles when you're in Ward 3 because you can take out your car. That's what happened to the police vehicle. That's what happened. It was more than a puddle. It was, it was it's a just substantial puddle. Yes, it's a Ward 3. It's the water under Ward the bridge. Puddle, yeah. The water under the bridge yeah. that has claimed many, many vehicles. Any further discussion? Roll call. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. That uh, passes in first, uh, second reading. Um, uh, Wes, excuse me. I'm sorry, but we're, we're conducting the meeting now at this point. If you want, you can converse out in the hall. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I understand, Sorry. but it's 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 distracting from the meeting. So if you, you're welcome to ask them out there if you want. Um, uh, we're now up to ordinances. Uh, Fifteen point three seven seven, ordinance regarding significant trees. Huh? Have you seen this before? This will be the first reading. I'll accept a motion. So moved. <laughs> Do you oppose it now? Is there a second? We should vote against it. Okay. Yes. Motion made and seconded. I'm sorry, I thought Gentlemen, I. Gentlemen, the sponsors. Do the sponsors want to speak to this? I, I don't remember what it's about because it's old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They were sap. Donald's up. It's a, it's a good sign. Trees grow very slow. <laughs> trees grow very slow. <laughs> Significant trees too. But well, Donald, you want to? Tre trees good. So I urge your support for it. Um, now this is this is an ordinance. This is zoning. Um, it is. It, it defines a significant tree as essentially a a a big tree. Um, and the legislative uh, intent here is that it's in the public interest to preserve the tree canopy in the city and that these older trees have some public value. And so when there are projects on private property that require site plan approval, that there be some rules and regulations about under what circumstances uh, such trees are removed, what replacement is required, um, if any, on the property, or alternatively, the uh, property owner could pay into a tree replacement fund. Um, and secondly, if there are significant trees on the property, then uh, there has to be a plan to protect them during construction. So 
that is what this that's what this does. Yeah. Um, is it the council's pleasure? I mean, I think it's appropriate that I should actually actually read this. Um, this is uh, this is this. Yes, right. The paper copy is the amended copy. There was a line that was missing from number five. Yeah. An ordinance, uh, the, the sponsored by Councilor Jesse M. Adams and Councilor Ryan R. O'Donnell, uh, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, being ordained by the City Council, the City of Northampton, the City Council assemble as follows: um, Section one, that uh, 350-2.1 be amended by inserting the following definitions in alphabetical order. First up is caliper diameter, and, the di and that means the diameter of a tree trunk of a new tree measured at 12 inches above the ground. Um, critical root zone, CRZ. The critical root zone, also known as essential root, is the portion of the diameter of a tree's root system that is uh, minimum necessary to maintain the stability and vitality of the tree. For the purposes of this section, the critical root zone shall be calculated by using the following formula. The diameter at the breast height in inches multiplied by 24. For example, a tree with a trunk diameter of 10 inches, the critical root zone would have to be, would have a diameter of 20 feet. Uh, the diameter at breast height, or DBH, uh, the diameter of a tree trunk measured at 4.5 feet above the ground. Drip line, a circular area around a tree encompassing the tips of its outermost branches from which the rainwater uh, needs to drip. Significant trees, any trees of 20 inches diameter breast height or larger or any other tree specifically identified as a specimen tree or any tr on, on any tree inventory plan adopted by the planning board. Okay. I didn't realize this is going to be multiple pages uh, in the. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I mean, I think to this point, I mean, this is just. <laughs> keep going, keep going. No, do you, <laughs> I will, Councilor Murphy, if you do. Sure, sure. do. <laughs> yes. uh, Reading. You want to waive it for the reading? <laughs> I think, okay. I'm not going to make that motion. Okay. Well, did I count the count the party? <coughs> We've seen it before. We have seen it before. I, I, as I read this, I realize I've read this aloud before. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, further discussion relative to what uh, <laughs> Councilor O'Donnell presented. Councilor LeBarge. Yeah, you? I would like to know significant trees what trees are significant are we talking about maple oaks and what else <laughs> any tree 20 inches actually by based on its yeah a significant tree that's a sig significant tree it's, it's not tight it's, oh it's, it's, size. Mr. So it's diameter because yeah. wayne told me a maple or yes. <laughs> i'd like to make a suggestion i'd like to recognize um uh, ms mesher uh, count <laughs> well, actually, I, before we do that, um, the, I want to, the, the line that was missing that was sent around, which is uh, the amended line 4.5 under D, is the addition is the section is not meant to regulate work performed by a utility company in maintenance of its rights of way or in its maintenance, repair, or replacement of infrastructure that is related to a development project requiring zoning relief. Amendment was added, and it was actually not in one of the versions of this that was circulated. And so, Councilor Dunn. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. And the other change that was not in a circulated version was a change that um, happened in ordinance last year um, in Section C, the change 18 to 12, so they would read the removal of any significant tree after July right. 1st, 2015, which we may want to change that date now. Uh, or within 12 months, immediately prior to such a site plan, et cetera, et cetera. And hey, like, I'm yeah, the, the, it's interesting. July 1st, 2015. That was yeah. uh, so. It has been a while. So I'd like yeah. to move an amendment if I could. Yes. Um, <laughs> we switch that to um, July uh, July 1st, 2016. That's fair. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just want to change the language in the in the new section that you read about the utility companies. I'd like to amend it such that it, it reads. Trees affected by work performed by a utility company. Um, that way, all those right. sections conform. So that's my amendment. 
You're saying trees affected. Second. So that the, the motion's made in the second for the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? Amendments. Have a little chance to catch up on the amendments. Okay. I got it. Okay. Uh, well, this is on the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. <coughs> So, did you still want to torture Carolyn Mish? But yes. No, it's okay. Yeah. I, mean, I just thought if, there's, if we really need to know what kinds of, I mean, significant trees, you know, there are specimen trees that the planning board has identified. But, I mean, suffice it to say, it's, it's any tree of 20 inches in diameter or more. It's, a, it's just an old, big tree, as opposed to a tiny tree, which it's not, you know, you don't have to worry about replacing those yet. And so the that answers your question, Council, sufficiently. Okay. The other distinction was, of course, um, trees of a specific type that might not grow to 20 inches but may still be older trees and may also be rare and hard to find, right? Am I correct in that, in that reading? Yeah, well, right, that's true. Yes, thank Any you. Any other tree? So, um, and it should be noted that the councilors introduced this some time ago and was actually held off principally so the mayor could establish um, a tree committee. Um, and in consultation with them, and then of course in the intervening time, of course there was an election, and there were, and we had to mm -hmm. extend over the agenda. And this has been this has been vetted pretty well, pretty well. Um, so this is this is not something that's come out like a bolt out of the blue. Talk about slow deliberation on some on an item. This one has been probably given more process than many many others items that we consider. Three calendar years. Three calendar years, <laughs> three calendar years. But you know, a tick on the geological clock or the lifetime of a tree. And so, actually, trees that were not previously identified under this have now <laughs> since grown to the proper dimensions and now qualify. Well, unfortunately, we probably lost who knows how many significant trees since since we submitted this. But, well, yeah, and and. and I know that, that relative to uh, some of the issues that came up locally were a lot about utility pruning for wires and things like that and, um, and, and removal of trees. Those were the ones that usually prompted the most um, res community response. But this, in this case, this instance, this is on uh, individual properties, uh, private properties, um, which um, in neighborhoods you'll see neighborhoods identify with the trees in many cases because they're so significant that that it's it, it, the ownership of the tree is the property owners but clearly there are and there are usually compelling reasons to remove that tree but at the same time there's also the neighborhood's compelling concern about how it impacts their their experience of their neighborhood yeah and just to be clear i know there was some <coughs> concern but whether it's onerous in any way for uh, property owners and I don't think it is. I think it's fair to say sometimes this is required uh, as on an ad hoc basis in certain instances by the planning board. So if anything, this just provides predictability and regularity about what you're going to need if you want a site plan. Just, <coughs> just, it doesn't protect private trees. It take it, it, it mm -hmm. they get removed and they get replaced in the public way, which is extremely important. Good point. Thank you. Because it yeah, contributes to the you. public shape tree right. canopy, which is, which is one of our express goals and right. what we're trying to do. There's been other efforts with the administration, but this is a really good council effort to do that. I think. Any further discussion on this? I would like to ask the question of Ms. Mish, if we would recognize her. Uh, all those in favor of recognizing Carolyn Mish, please say aye. 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 Sounds like unanimous. Carolyn, thank you. Do you remember this discussion before? <laughs> 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 oh, so my question, um, this only affects trees in the instance where somebody comes into the planning department and requires site plan review. So the enforcement is that they're trying to do business with your department and that's when this ordinance takes effect, correct? Right, so it's not just planning board, but anytime you need additional relief. So if it's a single family homeowner that wants to add on to their um, individual house and there happens to be a 22 inch tree in the side yard, that um, tree could be removed for the construction of that property owner because 
an addition to a single family house does not trigger zoning relief as defined in this section. So your typical homeowner, if they want to take down a 20 inch tree and they do not need some sort of permit from the city of Northampton, they can do that without issue. Right. I mean, if there were some other reason there was a non-conformity on the parcel and they needed to go to the zoning board for permission for expansion, then that would trigger the compliance with this. But if they don't need any sort of permit from the city of Northampton right. to do anything, they can take down any tree they like that's on their property. That's right. Okay. Um, what, well, you know, what, one of the things that concerns me about this, and I, I mention this only so that we keep this in mind, we always talk about how expensive housing is, how much it costs to do housing. And then we want people to do granite curbings. Now we want people to replace trees. Wh whenever a developer comes in and says they want to develop housing, we ask them why the housing is so damn expensive. It's because we keep creating obstacles that cost money for them to do that. And, and, and so I do want to point that out, that this is very much connected to what housing ultimately costs, granite curbings, replacing trees. They're all nice things to have, but then we can't turn around and say, why is our housing so expensive? You know, why is, you know, why is the affordable house at Village Hill $350,000? Only no one has ever chosen to do one of those. They build four and $500,000 things there. You know, this is all very much connected and we do participate driving up the cost of housing by all these nice little things that we had. So I'm not saying this is a bad idea, but I'm saying please don't disconnect ourselves from the effect that we have on the cost of things by all these little add-ons that we feel good about, that we say, yeah, let's do this, this is a feel-good thing, that trickles down to the cost of living in the city. You know, it's not just the water rate, it's all these little things that ultimately come back and cost the end user money. Councilor O'Donnell? I think that's a fair point to make conceptually. Um, I don't know how much practically it's going to add. So just to point out the last section, record keeping, the, uh, the planning, uh, Department of Planning and Sustainability shall collect annual totals of number and diameter, et cetera, et cetera, preserved and replaced. So we may have some numbers to speak to that either way, you know, in time. We'll be able to monitor the cost of, of this effort. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. But it will cost. You know, any time we make people do anything, replace trees, it costs. You know, just, you know, I, I don't know what the cost would be, but the cost would be there. And every time we add a cost, when we come around to saying, oh, my God, why are these things so expensive? Because we contribute to that when we do stuff like this. Uh, I also wouldn't discount the possibility that a developer may actually have a profit line in mo mind and that building a $500,000 house the impediment was not a tree ordinance or a granite curbing requirement, probably more profit inspired than, than the, those particular fees. But I take your point about it being cumulative, and this was Councilor Adams' point as well, you know, the death of a thousand cuts. But I think in the aggregate, um, if this is the tree that broke the camel's back as far as someone developing an affordable housing project, um, I think it's worthy of revisiting, but I suspect that this would not be the point. And we generally don't suspect any of our desires are the point, which is why things cost what they do. I appreciate the um, examination of kind of unintended consequences, Councillor Murphy, and I think if we're going to do true cost accounting, when we look at the purposes that trees serve in our city, in our community, and you think about how they prevent erosion and they clean the air and all kinds of things like that, that's, that is another kind of true cost accounting that tells us that we need to, in fact, think about removal of trees and what the cost is going to be to the community in the long term by removing trees without replacing them. So that's another mm -hmm. kind of side of that. Mm -hmm. No, and I love trees. I mean, I've managed Child's Park for over 20 years. I love trees. I take care of 36 acres worth of trees. And it's really expensive to care for trees. Um, I like them very much. I'm more referring to the, you know, the fact that we do things that make us feel good and then wonder why eventually the costs trickle down to the cost of housing. So. It's a fair point. Thank you. Yeah, just as, as a sponsor, I'll, I feel empowered to de defend uh, um, 
the idea that you're broaching is um, worthy of discussion. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's worthy of discussion. Theoretically, it's correct. Whether I don't think it's going to change any votes, but I just I wanted to point it out. If I <laughs> agree one way or the other, but I mean, yeah. Colin, so. did you vote? I just had a couple of um, points on, on uh, regarding that. Um, one of the other benefits of having some kind of threshold for looking at um, tree removal and replacement is that uh, it might cause um, pause in sort of the design process. So instead of looking at a parcel as a clean slate to do, to manipulate it the way you wish, if you know that there's a tree that triggers this threshold and might add cost or um, complications, there might, it might, encourage you to think uh, um, differently about how to design the parcel to um, maneuver around that, um, so which we don't have now. Um, so that's, that's one thing that um, I think is beneficial. And these are very large trees we're talking about. They're, we haven't been able to take an inventory <laughs> to this point, but I think they're, um, they're, they're few in the core part of the city, I would think that tr would trigger this. Um, so they really, the, it's meant to really capture those significant trees and it, you know. Sounds a good one. Uh, just just to, to, to adding to that, one, one, one feature of this that I, that, I, that I like very much is though in some cases, the same result might have happened in a more ad hoc fashion, uh, what you hear from developers is we don't like the ad hoc stuff. We, we, we like knowing the rules in advance. And uh, I think any time there's an opportunity to take what has become a, a practice in an informal give and take in, a, in, a, in an approvals process and codify it, uh, it's a step in the right direction. And this is one of those. Uh, further discussion? Okay. Roll call, please. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. So that passes in first reading. It will be revisited at the next meeting. Also up for first reading is item 16.003, an ordinance to delete fees from Chapter 174 of the City Code Book. Um, this is with a positive recommendation from the Committee on Finance, a neutral recommendation from the Committee, uh, the committee on Legislative Move Matters. Second. Motion's made. Is there a second? Second. Uh, discussion? Mm -hmm. Someone from, uh, let's see, who, who <laughs> so, someone from either committee want to discuss and describe the, the I, I can read this if you'd like. It, the, re the reason is essentially to clean up and mm -hmm. to conform, as Councilor O'Donnell said earlier, to the state. I mean, this is turning it over to the administrative side. Maybe right. you want the mayor to comment on why this is happening. Ronnie, you, or Councilor O'Donnell, you want to speak to this? I, whatever the, play, I mean, the, the, um, the council had an ordinance review committee in, uh, at the end of last year, and this, this came up, it was identified by the solicitor. Basically, we accepted a state law that empowers fees to be set administratively, and so uh, there's there's no need to have all the fees listed out in the code of ordinances. It so. should be noted that the city clerk's office now is uh, there all their fees posted on the website. Okay. Um, it, um, yeah. What's the council's pre uh, preference here? Do you want me to read the order? No. No. Good. Good, because the internet won't let me. Okay. It just says delete anyway. Just okay. Says. It is, it, so it's not like the fees are going away. It's not like the, it's, it's just where they're kept, essentially, and wh where they've been presiding. The only thing I'd note for the record is some of the discussion that happened in the Ordinance Review uh, Committee, um, which Councilor Adams was a part of as well, and he can speak to it um, also if he wants. But, um, you know, we talked about the fact that this is a, um, this is just a different kind of accountability we'll have for fees. I mean, the mayor's going to be setting fees, and there'll still be accountability about that. And we also are careful to note that fees are not arbitrary. They are, as we have been discussing, they are for services provided. So it's not like there's wiggle room. But 
in the future, I would just note that um, we could always we could always look at uh, whether or not it makes sense to have anything in our code about a, a global fee setting policy. For example, we talked about is there an, a, a hearing that's triggered automatically when a fee goes up by a certain amount over a certain period of time. Um, I'm not sure such a hearing would be triggered very often at all, but I do think that's a legitimate concept. I'm not really prepared to bring ideas forward on that today, but I do want to say that, I mean, the council may still have some role in that policy, but for the time being, it just makes sense to just get rid of this chapter. So. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Adams. No. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Uh, that passes in first reading. Next up, item 16.005, an ordinance pertaining to LED lighting. Uh, this first reading, this is, uh, and this is why I believe one of the reasons Carolyn Mish planned on coming here for, um, and again, I'm offline, so um, is the preference to waive reading? Certainly. Uh, Carolyn's still recognized, but um, there's a motion to put her on the board, second. Move approval. Uh, Carolyn, you want to step up and break it down for us? Um, I have a PowerPoint that um, I'll just go through quickly just to frame the context of the um, changes for the ordinance. I'm, I thought I'd walk through briefly the current sign regulations um, for both commercial districts and residential districts and the lighting standards associated with those signs and go through some of the safety and aesthetic issues that um, I think warrant a change to the sign ordinance and are um, proposed through this um, ordinance amendment. And basically the, the key is to differentiate between residential and commercial districts. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so if you could change the slide. So, and just to um, emphasize that this um, LED sign ordinance doesn't address um, what we refer to as billboard signs. They're off-premise signs, so they're on the highway corridors, um, 91 primarily. A couple of years ago, the council already adopted an ordinance that prohibits any LED signs to be installed on those billboard signs. So that's in a separate section of the code. And it's not addressed here. This is these are on-premise pre business and institutional type signs throughout the city. And um, the the reason this has come forward now is is um, in order to update the code to um, address more uh, newer and more modern technology that is being used um, for signs and lighting signs in particular. We've had uh, regulations in the code about flashing signs since 1975. Um, at that time, um, I believe neon signs were probably the, and, and just um, flashing um, directed light on signs were probably the um, most um, widely used type of lighting for signs. And at that time, it was determined that for safety reasons, um, the police chief would be in charge of determining whether a flashing sign should be allowed or, or how um, intermittent or um, the timing of the flashing, uh, whether or not it affected safe, traffic safety primarily. That fluctuated um, in the jurisdiction between the police department, the planning board, board of health at some point through those years. Currently, um, it's at the discretion of the police chief, and there's no specific specificity about flashing signs or the timing. Um, and so this proposed code change would clarify and spell out exactly what um, timing is appropriate for different districts so that um, it's clear, it's up front, people know what it is going in, and it's not subject to um, changing um, definitions by whoever happens to be in charge at that point in time within the police department. Um, 
There was, um, up until this point, um, we, there, are no, there have been no differentiations in lighting standards in residential districts versus commercial districts. And in 2007, we um, completely rewrote the standards for site lighting throughout the city and um, adopted a, what's referred to as a dark sky ordinance for site lighting. And we addressed sign lighting at that time just through um, specifications about the illumination levels for signs, but nothing about LED signs or the newer sort of video technology that's um, becoming more and more popular. So again, um, we have a distinction on type and size by district. Uh, we allow wall signs in the commercial districts. They're significantly larger um, provision or larger sign provisions in the commercial districts. Very small scale signs are allowed in some contexts in residential districts, mostly for schools and churches or other religious um, institutions or residential care facilities. In terms of ground signs, we allow ground signs by right in all of the commercial districts. And again, in residential districts, um, smaller scale signs are allowed for parks and churches and schools and um, nursing care facilities. And again, illumination is, is, um, is allowed um, across the board um, at the same levels with no curfews or no time limits. So again, the chain, why we're looking at the change now is to address safety issues with this new lighting technology that um, research has shown um, has a um, very distracting effect on, on drivers. So initially, some of the codes around the country and, the, and research was focused on highways and signage along highways, but also um, um, local corridors were reviewed for uh, trying to address the safety issues that these new video and, and constant scrolling um, signs had on, on drivers and the impacts to um, other drivers and other users of the road network. There are also aesthetic and neighborhood impacts that these new um, sign technologies um, have in terms of the um, brightness, the amount of text that's being um, constantly flashed or sc um, scrolling or rotating. Um, so the other uh, piece of this is to codify those um, flashing standards uh, for both residential and commercial districts. But again, look at the differences of the uses in those districts and the impacts that they have on businesses versus um, residential users. And um, I'd be happy, or if um, Councilor Dwight, you want to read through the whole code, that's <laughs> fine. But a summary of the changes are um, simply to define what an LED sign is. And um, that has been adjusted through some of the public hearing process to broadly describe it as an electronic sign that um, is not specified to a certain technology, but just um, refers to um, a range of video type screens or um, changing electronic messaging. Um, the industry standard is, is uh, refers to it as dynamic display board and create specifications for those signs. So different sizes allowed in different in um, residential districts versus commercial districts. Um, look at the illumination levels, a change to the time in which signs can be lit in residential districts. The proposal is um, 7 a.m. to 10 or 10 p.m. so that they turn off um, for schools and churches and um, nursing care facilities and residential districts have to be uh, turned off at 10. Um, the timing is slightly different for commercial districts. Um, it's proposed um, through public hearing discussion that was um, amended as well to allow the signs to be illuminated um, up until the close of business or 11 p.m., which is later, whichever is later. Um, and also to um, specify that the sign panel, in particular in residential districts, if there is um, an electronic display board, that it only encompasses 50% of the total sign allowed 
for that um, sign. So the Northampton High School sign is a good example of that. There's a plain um, panel that says Northampton High School, and then there's the message board that's below that, and that's approximately 50% of that total sign. So that's that would be an example of the uh, provision that's proposed in this ordinance for residential districts only. This There isn't a comparable one on the commercial district side. And then the, uh, we took the opportunity to go through and clarify some of the other sections of the sign code that um, to match the interpretation and implementation of the code that's been um, occurring over many years and um, just clean up the language. So there's some text changes that don't have anything to do with sign lights, um, but it was just an opportunity to clean that up. Um, another piece of that cleanup is sort of looking at um, um, currently special permit provisions in the commercial districts allow for larger signs or more than one sign. It also allows for taller signs. And this proposal would eliminate the special permit allowance to go taller for a sign. It would still allow a special permit by the Zoning Board of Appeals to have a bigger sign or more than one sign on a property. The idea behind the height um, limit um, for 15 feet um, in the highway business district, and I, I believe it's a uh, 10 feet in the downtown um, central business, <clears throat> was to um, bring that into um, consistency with the plan and the vision for the gateway corridors uh, to really reduce the overall building size and sign <coughs> sign size really for those um, corridors that. Um, we as a community have d decided our um, um, need to be redesigned to focus more on on all users and not just highway traffic or highway volume type uses. Um, and then there, the latest packet that you have sh um, represents the modifications that have occurred through the public hearing process since the ordinance was initially introduced. I think that's it. Questions? Yes. Um, <coughs> also the Carolyn, so uh, this ordinance, we're only addressing new signs. So the older signs would be grandfathered, correct? Right. Any sign, <coughs> that's correct. Um, any signs that are currently internally illuminated or illuminated by lights directed on them. If the property owner chose to upgrade a sign and to this LED technology, then at that point, um, the code would kick in. <coughs> Otherwise, they stay grandfathered. Right. So, and if there are any signs that are currently um, electronic message or LED, those would continue to be a. Um, remain in compliance as non-conformity non if they happen to be. Councilor Bidwell. <coughs> uh, Carolyn, would you, would you mind just highlighting what has changed since the time you appeared before Community Resources Committee? And, and we, I know there have been a number of changes, and I'm not sure if it's, if it's easy to do that, but I would just be curious what, what's, what's different from when it left Community Resources. Sure. <coughs> so, I think the biggest difference, um, there were some syntax errors and, and typos that w um, we changed, so I'm not going to go over those. But the significant changes um, really related to the, um, I'll start with um, in the commercial district, um, for these electronic message boards, um, the um, signs must um, display or may display changes or change in text every 30 seconds. Originally, when it was introduced, the um, planning board had um, proposed that uh, messaging would change once every minute or could change up to once every minute. Um, so through the public hearing process, um, th it was recommended to drop that down to once every 30 seconds. And then, um, 
the other change in this, so on top of transitioning once, uh, allowance for transitioning um, messaging every 30 seconds, uh, the message has to transition immediately so that there's no blanking or fading. And that's always, that was in the initial introduction as well. Um, and then the dis at that, um, the original um, ordinance uh, recommended that or proposed that the um, curfew for sign lights in the commercial district be 10 p.m., the same as residential districts. So through the conversation, um, there was a recommendation to change that to allow more flexibility for commercial users to allow um, signs to be turned off at the close of business or 11 p.m. So if a business um, closed earlier in the afternoon and wanted to keep the sign on for advertising purposes, that um, property owner could keep the sign on up until 11 p.m., even if the business had closed earlier in the day. Um, and another change in the residential district, um, that came forward through the public hearing process was to um, put a restriction on the sign heights in residential districts to be consistent. There, there already is was a maximum height um, for a ground sign of five feet, <coughs> but that wasn't specified for every type of ground sign, so that was um, inserted in section 7.3C. Um, to specify that any kind of ground sign that's allowed in the residential district can't exceed the height of five feet. Uh, and I believe those that's the extent of the, the significant changes. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, I note that on residential displays, their changes are limited between to 30 minutes as opposed to 30 seconds. That's right. Any other discussion? Any other questions for Carolyn? Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. That passes in first read. <clears throat> and now we have item 16.028, and this is an ordinance to delete <coughs> subdivision of land <coughs> after 290 of the code book on first read. Approved. Approved. A positive recommendation from the committee on community resources on February 22nd to 2014. This is a voice, vo voice vote for yes, zero no. Positive recommendation from the Committee on Legislative Matters on February 22nd, 2016. Um, actually, I just said this, 2014. I'm pretty sure that wasn't. Yeah, that's a typo. That's, that's a typo. It should be 2016. Um, uh, again, voice vote yes, zero no, one absent. Um, so the motion's made and seconded. Uh, discussion? Questions? <laughs> Carolyn's still here and, and eager to go home, I'm sure. But Carolyn, can you, can you, um, oh, oh, Council Down. Uh, go ahead. You were poised. Go I ahead. I thought I would save Carolyn. Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? It's, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. The, um, um, these are regulations that ought not to be in ordinance. These are regulations that the planning board adopts. And so the planning board has adopted them, and we've just kind of copied them into our ordinance because we did. But they exist outside of our ordinance, and there's no real reason to have them in the ordinance. So. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Right. As as Pam said, this this came out of ordinance review. This is another product of the ordinance review committee, which this is another good significant job, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> that's another good job. Significant tree we're pruning out of the uh, right. yeah, right. just deleting right. chapters left and right. right. So means you have to grow another one somewhere. Mm -hmm. right, well, <laughs> count on that to happen. Just by just itself. On that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, they yeah, exist yeah. outside. They've been adopted he he, by the planning he, board. He, yeah. he noted that it, it exists under the purview of the agents of the uh, planning board. Yeah, because in fact, I mean, it would be the only chapter of our ordinance that we would be unable to amend as a council. We would have no power to amend. Well, as I would, in any way, that would make a difference. So, yep. Further discussion, questions? Roll call, please. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. There are no updates from the council president, committee chairs. Councillor. Um, as the mayor already mentioned, um, Monday is our regularly scheduled community resources meeting, and the first half we're going to continue doing our sort of exploration on our path forward with the committee study request but um, the second half is the beginning of our fact finding um, and have invited some um, some <coughs> groups that represent interests that are relevant to downtown um, the downtown economy downtown's economies um, that already have data or presentations that are ready to go for us um, so we have as the mayor said um, Terry Masterson is going to, the uh, economic development director is going to come. And um, we've also invited the uh, Pioneer Valley Worker Center and um, the Downtown Neighborhood Association and the Chamber. So I'm not sure if all four of them will be there, but at least three have said that they will be there to give us, you know, talk to us about what they already know and have done. And everyone's welcome. <laughs> Could you state? The date and time again? Yes, yeah, so it's Monday the 21st, uh, 5 o'clock here. Thank you. I, I just, though, wanted to, um, I think you had suggested that the first hour of the meeting was going to be reserved for, for the, um, right, so I said the first half. So, right, so from 5 to 6, we're going to conduct sort of the normal business of the committee and right. also continue talking about how we're going to um structure the rest of the committee study requests and then the second half from six to seven to clarify is when we'll be hearing presentations or getting information uh any other committee chairs okay. uh i'll accept a motion to adjourn a move. second all those in favor of adjourning please say aye aye, aye. thank you all very much